So the model related data annotations basically help your models uh, maintain data integrity. Uh, so a lot of them are used for data validation. And they also help render out the views to make them a little bit more user friendly. Uh, there are also data annotations that affect how the table itself looks. You know, what you name a table, what the columns end up being named. Hey, those are schema changes. And we're going to look at both types. Uh, just keep in mind that if it basically impacts the schema or the structure of your database that you have to pull in the data annotations.schema namespace. And if it deals with data validation uh, or how things are going to display in the forms, then you're just pulling in regular data annotations. So the first one that we're going to look at is key. And you can specify a primary key. Uh, and we've already talked about the conventions in Entity Framework, where it looks for the class name followed by ID, or it looks for ID by itself, and it assumes that's the primary key. Now, if you are going to have a property named something else, you do need to put the key attribute in so that it knows that that's the primary key. Otherwise, it gets super confused. So here we have a class called members. And you can see that membership ID, which uh, we want for the primary key, does not follow MVC conventions. The MVC conventions would dictate that we use ID or members ID. Okay, so because we're using membership ID, we need to use the key attribute. And then Entity Framework knows that that's the primary key. Now, specifying composite keys, which would be primary keys that have multiple properties, uh, you pretty much have to use data annotations for this. And then you would want to tell it the order of the keys. So you're going to use the key attribute, and then you're going to use column, and in parentheses, order equal, and then you know, is this the first column in the key? Is this the second column in the key? You know, where does this data go as far as the key? So here's a little example, uh, and it's a driving license class. And you can see that for the key, we have the license number and the issuing country. Okay, and so license number is going to be our first column in the key. And the second column is issuing country. So concurrency check. Uh, in a database, a concurrency conflict happens when one person grabs a row to edit, and then another person grabs that same row. So they both have the exact same row or record, and they're making changes. Whoever saves the change last, those are the updates that are going to be in the database. So that is a concurrency conflict. Now, Entity Framework uses something called optimistic concurrency checking, which basically allows these conflicts to occur. So they don't lock out the row when somebody has it for editing. You know, if there's not a lot of activity on a database, this isn't going to be a problem. Uh, sometimes coding to prevent this problem is very time consuming. But there is a little attribute that you can add to a property 
in a class where it will actually check to make sure that that hasn't changed before it does the update. And so the attribute you would add is called concurrency check. And you can see in this little example, we're looking at our course class and it has concurrency check above the title. So if someone uh, was editing this and then I chose to edit this, it would check for title to see if that was the same before it did my update. Okay, and that's just a little preventative step. Now, if it wasn't the same, what would it do? It would throw an error. And I'd go back to the view and then have to check the values and redo the edits. Now you'll also notice in this example that we have a timestamp. And when you're using code first, the timestamp is treated the same way as a concurrency check. And it's another thing that you can do to uh, basically ensure that no one else is making the edits. So you've grabbed your record or row, it's got a timestamp on it. And then when you go to do the update, you know, is the timestamp different? Indicating somebody else had gone in and made a change. Okay, and in our little example, we have a concurrency check on the title, and we also have a timestamp on a timestamp property. And it's that property is only used to keep track of the time that changes were made. Another attribute that is pretty common is required. Uh, and so basically, if you put required above a property, that means they have to fill it in. If they don't, they get an error. If you have a numeric field, uh, you can put a maximum length. Uh, you can do this on a text field, a numeric field. Basically, it specifies how many characters they can type in. Okay, it's one of the ways that you can ensure that your data is accurate. So in this little example, we have max length on title, and we set it at 24, so you cannot key in a title that is longer than 24 characters. Okay, and you can see the error message that it displays is very descriptive. Uh, this is the generic message. The field title must be a string or array type with a maximum length of 24. Uh, in addition, you can set a minimum length. Okay, so in this particular example, uh, title has quite a few properties. It is required. We have concurrency check on it. It has a maximum length of 24. It's got a minimum length of five. And all of those are being applied to the title property. If any of those are violated, we are going to get an error. And the error will change uh, depending on what the violation is. Uh, so what Entity Framework does is it throws something called an Entity Validation Error. Okay, and we've been looking at the default errors, but you actually can control the message uh, so that it'll display a custom message if we, you want, and we will talk about that a little later. Uh, string length. So string length lets you specify a size for string data types and you cannot use it with any other data type. So it's kind of like max length, but it's specific for strings. 
Okay, so you can see we have max length 24. Uh, here we said string length 20. Uh, this one is used in student on the first and middle name. We also have a string length of 30 on the last name. And the key here is that the data type has to be string in order for you to use string length. Uh, range. Range lets you define a minimum and a maximum value for a numeric field. Okay, and here we are applying the range of one to six on credits. And if they try to go above that or below that, we get an error message. Uh, display name equals string. You guys have already seen this being used. Uh, you can basically change the default display name from the property name to whatever you specify. And this would be the name that is displayed in the view. Uh, the HTML helpers will look at this name and display it in the form instead of the property name. So in this little example, the property name is first mid name, which is actually a terrible label in a form. So that would be replaced with first name, which makes a lot more sense. Okay, and so I do have an example of HTML.label4, and you can see that it's uh, using first mid name here. We've specified that. And um, when it actually goes to generate the view, if we leave it like this, without specifying first mid name, it would actually pull in that first name display. And that's why, even though we've generated all of our views already, because we're using those strongly typed helpers, it will pull in any attribute changes that we make to our models after the view has been created because it's always looking at the model and pulling that in and generating the view. So data type and display format attributes can be used to specify a special data type that has formatting requirements. Uh, data type itself is an enumeration. It includes lots of different data types, including date, time, currency, email. Okay, those are some of the more popular ones. And display format basically says how you want that particular data type formatted. Uh, so this little example has a data type, data type dot date indicating that it is a date. And then we have a display format attribute where we have data format string equals, and then we have uh, codes that indicate how we want the year, month, and day displayed. Uh, apply format in edit mode equals true. So uh, any of the edit views would display this as well. And this is being applied to the enrollment date. And here's just another example uh, of an attribute applied to posted date. Uh, here's another one where we have a display format. Uh, for an empty string. Uh, if the string is empty, then we want it displayed basically with blanks. And then here is another attribute, basically specifying that we have a password.
So we just talked about quite a few attributes that deal with data validation or ensuring your data is accurate and controlling how that data is displayed. Uh, also, we looked at how to specify the primary key. And this next set of attributes is going to basically modify the schema. And the next video will discuss those.